This is Dennis Delaney. We met eight years ago. We were working together in a um, nonprofit, and he's here to talk to you about um, eating a whole food plant-based diet and also um, just kind of his story, his yeah. life of how, where he got, how he got here. So um, this is Dennis Delaney. Thanks, Cindy. Well, so first of all, thanks for letting me take uh, about 50 minutes of your time. So what I wanted to talk to you today, first of all, is about my journey from being an omnivore, basically eating the standard American diet, and, and my experience and how that uh, impacted primarily my body, and then what prompted me to make a change and switch to a whole food, plant-based diet. In the interest of uh, being transparent, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist. I'm just an average Joe. I'm not here to convert you to eating a whole food plant-based diet. I'm just here to share some of my experience around that. Now, I understand that you guys all got to see the movie The Game Changers. Just by a show of hands, um, how many of you found that movie informative, enjoyed it? Okay, so most of you. Yeah, it's a very powerful movie. Now, in that movie, they, they take more, more, all the personal stories are all from a fitness perspective and primarily athletes and how making that switch um, for themselves impacted their personal performance. I'm not an athlete, so my perspective is really just going to be focused on uh, the impact on my health, um, the environment, and specifically climate change, and the moral and ethical reasons of why I made that decision for myself. And again, I'm not here to convert you to eating a whole food plant-based diet, so if you were worried about that, you can put that right out of your mind. Um, before I kind of talk about my journey, um, there's uh, a person, his name is Herbert Spencer. Um, he lived in the 19th century. He was a very well-respected, well-renowned um, philosopher, biologist, uh, anthropologist, and, and uh, sociologist. And the reason I bring him up is back in the 19th century when Charles Darwin proposed the theory of evolution, that was revolutionary at that time, and it really took most of the learned science and dumped it upside down on its head and there was a lot of people, governments, religions, um, scientists who were like, this is heresy, this can't be true. But over time, we've come to realize that it is, in fact, the science is valid, right? And Herbert Spencer was at the forefront of leading uh, and advocating for that change. And there's one particular quote uh, that he has, <clears throat> and I want to share it with you, and I kind of want to um, preface it with, keep, it, it, it's really about keeping an open mind. But he says, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in ever or woman in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is contempt prior to investigation. And so the reason I, I share that with you is most of the major changes in my life have come from this kind of cycle um, that I call epic failure like having something really bad happen to me based on decisions I've made, and then getting new information and making some changes. And so uh, my journey uh, from being a, uh, somebody who ate the standard American diet, and that's why I put up here on the board, standard American diet, the acronym is SAD. I think that's truth in marketing. The standard American diet is SAD because it does have pretty negative consequences for our personal health most of the major diseases that plague uh, Western countries, and particularly in the United States, are a result of that sad diet. A lot of the negative impacts that relate to climate change are impacted by that sad diet. And the moral and ethical treatment of animals is also impacted. So uh, I kind of want to talk a little bit about that journey. So um, before I um, became whole food plant-based, um, the first major changes I made in my life so this is a younger version of me, back from the last century. I'm 25 years old in that picture. I'm 57 and a half now. When that picture was taken, um, I weighed 200 pounds. Um, I weighed 210 pounds today, so I'm 10 pounds heavier. Um, but there was a lot of changes in between back then and today. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But the three major uh, impactful lifestyle changes that have changed the trajectory of my life, the first was... A couple of years before that picture was taken, I was failing in every department of life. I'm not gonna bore you with the whole story, um, but the primary cause of that was my decision related to alcohol and drugs. 
All right. So I made a decision based on some epic failures that I was going to stop doing that one day at a time. And, uh, and I was able to um, keep that goal in my life. Um, now, about a couple months before that picture was taken, I'm the youngest of four. I, have, uh, I had three older sisters. One of them passed away from cancer. And, uh, and my sister, <clears throat> when she was 26 years old, got diagnosed with lymphoma cancer. It's one of the fastest growing cancers. And unfortunately, um, they didn't diagnose it because she was pregnant. She was pregnant with her first child, and, and she was getting sick, and they didn't really know why, and they did a bunch of tests, and then when they finally figured out, oh, you got cancer, um, they couldn't treat the cancer because she was six months pregnant, and it would have caused her to lose the baby. So by the time my niece was born and they started to treat my sister's cancer, unfortunately, time was not on her side, and ultimately she perished from that disease. But the last time I went to visit my sister in the hospital up at Stanford University Oncology Ward, I was obviously very sad about my sister's condition. Who wouldn't be sad if somebody you love and care about is suffering from a, a disease that ultimately would take their life? And I was super angry at the doctors. I remember standing in the hospital thinking, damn it, there just should be something that these doctors could do for my sister. And my sister, her biggest sadness was that she probably wasn't going to live long enough to have a relationship with her then newborn infant daughter. Now, the reason I share this with you is I was so frustrated, so angry, that while visiting my sister, I, I was just like overwhelmed by these emotions. And so my coping me mechanism at that time was I went outside and I stood out on the curb of the oncology ward and I smoked a cigarette. I was a two pack a day smoker at that time. And as I'm smoking this cigarette, thinking about how unfair it is and my sister's dying of cancer and Western medicine can't help her, a light bulb went on. And the light bulb was, Dennis, you're a complete idiot using tobacco as the number one cause of lung cancer, right? We all know that, right? Some of you are nodding. So the light bubble went on. I said, well, if you're really upset about cancer in your sister, maybe you shouldn't be doing things that cause cancer in you. So I quit smoking, quit tobacco. So that was the second biggest lifestyle change. So then the next 20 years that followed this picture, let me see if I don't screw this up because I screwed it up last class. So, okay, so this is taken 20 years later on Christmas Day. A uh, beautiful one on the right is my wife, Deb. That's my son, Jack, and my daughter, Lauren. So that picture was taken in 2009. And uh, I weighed 283 pounds when that picture was taken. All right? And what happened for me is I had been very athletic most of my life. I liked to surf. When I was in high school, I played basketball. I was a swimmer. I played soccer. As I got into my adult life and I launched a, a very successful career, as a sales executive, I had to travel around the country. Um, the clients we called on were restaurants. So I got to eat a lot of really great uh, meals in a lot of different restaurants. Um, and the impact of all of that was I stopped exercising because I didn't have time. And I put on a lot of weight. And I generally felt lethargic most of the time. And so this was taken at Christmas in 2009. And, uh, and my son, Jack, and my daughter, Lauren, they both played sports. And, uh, why is that not going down? And uh, so my son, Jack, was really concerned about my, uh, about my health. He's like, Dad, you're getting real heavy. And um, like I would go to play basketball with him, and I'd be winded. Like after you know, a couple minutes, I'd just be you know, bent over heaving. And um, so I went to see the doctor and got a physical. And the doctor said, you know what? You're overweight for your size and your age. Your cholesterol's high. Your blood pressure's high. And I said, well, what should I do? And, and the doctor said, well, you should exercise more. You should change your diet. And I'm going to put you on medication to uh, help with your blood pressure and your cholesterol. Now, we live in a free country, so doctors can't impose their will on you. I said, OK, that sounds interesting. I'll do one of those. I started exercising. I didn't want to be on blood pressure medication. Didn't want to be on statins. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'm not eating bad foods, I'll just cut back on my portion size. So that was my solution for me. Uh, shortly after uh, the previous picture was taken, uh, I worked uh, and, and was on the road a lot. And when I would come home on the weekends, uh, my family, both my parents and, and one of my siblings who lives locally, I live in Santa Cruz, we'd have these big family dinners on Friday night. And after dinner, I would be exhausted from a busy week and, and, of course, eating that standard American diet. And this is me passing out on the floor having what I call a food coma. You ever eaten, like, too much 
uh, Thanksgiving dinner and then you just want to like curl up in a ball and take a sleep or eat a big beef burrito and the next thing you know you're on the couch. So, so my son saw me and he thought it would be really cute to take a little pretzel stick and stick it in my mouth and then he snapped a little photo on his phone. And this was really my low point as it relates to the weight gain and, and lack of exercise. So that was my motivation to start exercising more. So I went to a gym, hired a personal trainer, started exercising uh, every day, five to six days a week. I lost about 30 or 40 pounds, felt a little bit better, but I didn't really change how much or what I was eating, I just changed the portion size, right? So then, you know, things got better. Oh, just cutting my head off here. I, I lost some weight, I had more energy, but then this picture was taken in um, uh, late, no, or excuse me, early December 2015. And um, that's me. So I'm a little thinner, but I'm still heavier than I uh, should be for my size. And this was a dinner. Uh, my father, in 2015, my father, um, who had had several heart attacks, and I should also share with you that in my family, on both sides of my family, heart attacks, high blood pressure, strokes, diabetes, cancer, I've had a lot of my relatives impacted by the, those three different diseases. And my father, um, that year, had been battling cancer for six years and he ultimately passed. And it was a very stressful year, both losing my father, my work schedule was really busy. I, I kind of let up on my exercise regime a little bit. And I don't know about you guys, but when you're stressed out and, and you're tired, don't you tend to want to have like a bowl of ice cream just to forget about your problems? I know I do, and I did. So, you know, I put a few pounds back on and this was actually a dinner that we had the day after my dad's funeral. And the only reason I put that up there is if it's the last picture I have before I had my heart attack. Um, and there's like scalloped potatoes and uh, shrimp and rolls with butter and you know, a, a lot of animal products on the table. So two weeks after that picture was taken, <clears throat> um, between Christmas and New Year's, uh, my wife's a flight attendant, so she wasn't home. My, my children are now adults, they were off at college. So my wife and I are empty nesters and I went to the gym in the morning I didn't have to work that day. And while I was at the gym, I just felt generally tired. I didn't have a lot of energy. And after I went to the gym, uh, I was hungry. I wanted lunch. So I went to the, my favorite taqueria. And I got what I usually got at that taqueria, which was a big carnitas burrito. And I ate that burrito. And right away, I had heartburn. Now, I've never had heartburn before in my life. Uh, I love spicy food. But I remember eating that burrito, getting the heartburn, and my first thought was, I was 55 at the time, oh damn, I'm, I'm getting to that age where maybe I can't eat spicy food anymore. So I went home, I drank a big glass of water, just kind of read some books and relaxed at the house. Heartburn went away, but I still felt low energy, didn't feel so good. Next day, I had the day off, got up, did the same thing. Uh, only this time after working out, I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't have a burrito, I shouldn't have spicy food. So I went to another uh, restaurant near our house that has a deli that has healthy foods and I got a big turkey sandwich. And I ate the turkey sandwich and I got heartburn. So then I thought, oh man, maybe I'm getting an ulcer, right? And, and it, it, eventually the heartburn went away, but again, I felt lousy. So now day three, my wife, Deb, who's a flight attendant, she was back from her trip. It was a Monday, so I went back to work. And I still felt generally like low energy. And I chalked it up to the fact that, well, you know, your father recently died. You had a very busy, busy travel year this year. You're just kind of like grieving, low energy, depression, right? That was the story I told myself. Um, so I worked that day, and then as luck would have it, um, shortly after my father passed away, all the appliances in my parents' house died. And so my mother basically needed to have her kitchen remodeled. So my wife and I committed to doing that for my mom. So I picked up my mom after work, my sister joined us and my daughter, and we went to Sears, bought some new appliances for my mom. We went to one of our favorite local restaurants. I had a big bowl of turkey chili, healthy, right? And a salad. After I took my family members home, as I was driving home, the heartburn came back, but this time on a scale of one to 10, it was a nine. It felt like searing hot knives stabbing into my chest. I was a little bit concerned. I came into the house, my wife who had been away on business was home. She was watching the Warriors game, Golden State Warriors were huge fans. And right away she noticed, she goes, are you okay? I said, no, I got really bad heartburn. She said, you never get heartburn. I said, I know, I've had it for three days. 
She's like, you, we should go to the doctor. I said, no, 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 I'm going to be fine. I'm just going to drink a glass of water. I'm going to go to bed. So I got a glass of water. I went in the room. I put my pajamas on. I got in bed. As I laid there, the pain didn't diminish, right? And I said a little prayer. I'm like, God, I don't know what this is, but just help me, right? And like 10 seconds later, my wife walks in the room, and she says, get up, put your clothes on. I'm taking you to the ER. And I said, no, I'm fine. You're overreacting. I just had a glass of water. I just need to sleep. Now, she knows me really well. And she says, you know, Dennis, I know you like choices. So your choices are you can get up and put your clothes on. I'll take you to the ER. Or I can call an ambulance, and they can come get you and take you to the ER. But, but those are your choices. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the ER. So I put on my clothes. We went to the hospital. They put me in the exam room. Uh, they started doing tests. Within a very short period of time, there was like tons of doctors and nurses and all this equipment. They're like, dude, you're having a heart attack. And it turns out that not only was I having a heart attack, but when they went in and uh, took me into the, for a cat procedure, I had three arteries. One was 90% blocked, one was 75% blocked, and the third was 40% blocked. So they put two stints in to open up those arteries. And, um, and I remember thinking as I was in the lab, one of the nurses in the lab where they do this procedure uh, at the local hospital says, uh, you've been here before, haven't you? Well, I, I hadn't. I, I've been generally healthy my whole life. I've never had like a major operation or procedure. But it occurred to me that like two years before, my father had his second heart attack and I was the one that brought him to the hospital. And this nurse remembered me. And right away the light bulb went on. It's like, oh, you're, follow you're following in your father's footsteps, but not in a good way, right? So um, at that point, I decided to make some lifestyle changes. And one of the benefits for me um, is they sent me to a cardiac rehab program where I learned about you know, exercise, stress reduction, but more importantly, about proper diet. Now, I'd like to be able to stand here and tell you that on that day, I, I completely cut out all animal products and went whole food plant-based. I didn't. I, my, my change has been incremental and slow changes over time. So I cut out all red meat. I cut out most, not all of the dairy, but like most of the cheese. Stopped eating ice cream. Still liked nonfat milk in my coffee for a while. I ate uh, switched from eating red meat to mostly fish and a little bit of turkey and chicken. And some things, positive things happened. One, I started to lose weight, started to feel better. My cardiologist was happy with my improvement, but I was still taking, uh, I had to take a medication for blood pressure and one for cholesterol. Um, so now fast forward, let me scroll down here. So this was taken in 2017. So you can see I, I'm a lot thinner. And another great thing happened in my life in that my daughter, Lauren, had her first child, my grandson, Leo, and that's my mother there. And, and so I became a grandfather. And I really, not that I didn't want to live before, but I really wanted to be there for my children and my grandchildren, also for my widowed mother. So my lifestyle choices became really important, right? Um, at the beginning of this last year, or excuse me, at the end of last year, my wife, Deb, and I, she's a flight attendant. Um, one of the benefits of marrying a flight attendant is I've gotten, I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world. And if I behave myself, and I agree to carry my wife's suitcase, she'll let me travel with her. So we've been to 43 countries. And it's something we really enjoy doing together. Well, <clears throat> in the summer of 2018, we were coming back from a trip. And you know my role is to carry the suitcases. So we're walking through San Francisco airport after we got off the plane. And I turn around, and my wife's not behind me. And I see uh, you know, about 20 yards behind me in the terminal. She's kind of standing against the wall. She doesn't look good. I'm like, honey, what's wrong? She's like, I have chest tightness in my chest, I feel weak, I feel dizzy. Those are all signs of heart attack. So we got home and she had a couple more episodes between the airport and getting home. So we took her to the ER, they do a bunch of tests. The doctor comes in and she says, well, I have good news and I have bad news, which do you want first? And we're like, well, we want the good news. Well, you didn't have a heart attack, they tell my wife, you didn't have a heart attack. Okay, that's good news, what's the bad news? Well, you have uh, bilateral pulmonary embolisms in plain layman's English, she had seven blood clots in her heart. That is a serious, serious medical condition, could have killed her. In her lungs. Excuse me, in her lungs, excuse me, yeah. I would only know that because I heard this Yeah, story. yeah. Um, so they, they did some um, treatment on her. She was in the uh, intensive care unit for five days, and when she got out, she decided, 
based on some research she had done, that she was going to switch to a whole food plant-based diet because in her research, she learned that part of what caused her medical condition, it's not the only cause, but it was one of the primary causes, was this sad standard American diet. And so she made that change for herself. I was the beneficiary in that I started eating and I was already had already changed most of my diet uh, after my first heart attack, but she became vegan. And, um, and so I still continue to eat a little bit of fish, uh, a little bit of dairy. Beginning of this year, we, we took a vacation. And prior to my wife's hospitalization, we had planned a trip to Bhutan, which is um, up in the Himalayas. And it was going to be a 10-day trip. We were really looking forward to it. And after my wife had her medical incident, the doctor said, there's no way you can go there because we would have been up at 11,000 uh, foot elevation for 10 days. And that just wasn't going to work for her at that time. So we were disappointed. And my wife uh, said, you know, let's, let's make some other plans for a different vacation. So she found this cruise, and she comes to me and she's like, I found this great cruise. It's a 10-day cruise. We're going to go to a bunch of different places in the Caribbean that we haven't been to before. And it's a vegan cruise. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Okay. And, and so the ship we were on, there were 3,000 passengers. A, a little over 1,000 of us were eating vegan food. The rest were eating just standard American diet. So the reason I agreed to go on that, one, I wanted to support my wife. Two, I said, I'll try the vegan thing, but if I don't like it, I can still go to the other bar and have my bacon and other stuff that I like, right? So I had a backup plan. But one of the things that happened for me is, and this has kind of been how I think about change in my life. So if I uh, were to think about becoming vegan for the rest of my life, that's a big deal, right? Because then you start playing the tapes in your head. What am I going to do at Thanksgiving? Can I never have a burrito? Blah, blah, you know, the, just like an endless list my mind starts making. What's manageable is just for today, I'm going to eat vegan. Tomorrow, I might do something entirely different. But just for today, I'm going to eat vegan. So that's the approach I took. It's the same approach I used when I quit tobacco. It's the same approach I used when I quit using intoxicants. Just for today, I'm not going to do it. And each day, I renew that decision. Now, the benefit of doing that is while I was on this cruise, I found that by like day three, I felt even better. And I was very fortunate. It was a vegan cruise, so there were vegan chefs, and the food was phenomenal. So this notion I had that I'm only going to be eating salads and you know uh, uh, sunflower seeds for the rest of my life, that's just not true. That was just a story in my head. Um, but then also on that cruise, there were several doctors and nutritionists, many of whom are featured in the film. You all watch The Game Changers. So Dr. Esselstein was on there, his son Rip Esselstein, uh, Dr. Ornish, and they were giving lectures about um, the effects of the SAD diet on the body. And that really changed how I thought about the food I was putting in my mouth. And so with that, um, I've been whole food plant-based since. Now, let me scroll forward here. That's my grandson, Leo. Uh, this is Leo and I. We, I watch him four days a week. My, my daughter's uh, back in school and she works full time. So my wife and I watch him four days a week. Leo and I like to take bike rides. And so the three areas that this change has made for me personally in my life, one is my health. I want to be alive. I want to be vibrant. And I want to live a long time. And I really don't, don't want to go out from a heart attack, a stroke, cancer, or diabetes. It's not how I want to go out. I've watched other relatives die that way. I prefer not to go that way if I have some impact on it. I also want to make sure that I set a good example for him, and I also want to make sure that the world I leave behind, i.e. the impact of eating whole food plant-based and the positive impact that has on environment, is going to impact him because he, hopefully, God willing, he'll be here another 70 years after I'm gone. And I want to make sure that the planet he inherits is better than the one I leave. And whole food plant-based eating can have that impact and lastly, there's the more moral and ethical reasons. I just want to share some stats. I don't want to bore you and pepper you with a bunch. But as it relates to health, and these actually, they cover them in the film you watch. But so 60% of all deaths in the United States from adults, so people 18 years or older, 60% of all deaths are three primary causes. Cardiovascular disease, which is high blood pressure, strokes, heart attack, cancer, predominantly breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men, uh, colon rectal cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, 
Uh, these are all foodborne illnesses. Most of them you do not inherit from your parents. You might have a, pre, a genetic predisposition, but the food you eat is what really triggers it and, and sets the disease off. And then last but not least, diabetes, which is caused by obesity. So one out of three adults in the United States has cardiovascular disease, and one out of six adults has some form of cancer. I don't want to be in those stats anymore. Um, when you guys saw the movie, um, because stats can mean a lot of different things. I, I like to kind of boil it down to like, how does that impact me? What change can I make that's going to have an immediate impact? Do you guys remember the scene in the movie where they bring the three football players in and they have them eat? Uh, one guy eats a chicken burrito, one eats a beef burrito, one eats a bean burrito. They draw blood. Then they come back the next day. Each of them eats a bean burrito. They draw blood. And then they show them their blood, right? You guys remember that scene? And the ones who ate meat, their blood was super cloudy. But then the next day, they look at their blood sample from just eating plants, and it's clear. That's probably the, the most impactful thing you can see about the effects of animal products on our body. But if you boil that down, if you eat a half a pound, excuse me, a quarter pound of ground beef, so think about like a quarter pounder with cheese or a beef burrito, what that does to your veins, it constricts your veins 40%. It increases inflammation in your body by 70%. Those are not good things for long-term health. But more importantly, what does it do to the environment? So the water that's required to raise uh, the cattle that are in a quarter pound burger, it takes 450 gallons of water to produce that quarter pound of beef. And you might be thinking, well, what's 450 gallons of water? That's the equivalent of taking 18 10 minute showers. So every time I eat a cheeseburger, that uses as much water as taking 18 showers, three weeks worth of showers. We all live in a, in a time when climate change is real. Here in California, we've, we have these drastic wildfires. Part of that's 99% of it's due to climate change, uh, not having enough uh, uh, water in the ground, things of that nature. So just making that little change makes a huge difference. By switching to a whole food plant-based diet, um, one person can save one million liters of water annually by not eating animal products. What is one million liters of water? That's enough water to fill 18 swimming pools. It's pretty powerful when you think about it. The emissions from an animal-based diet, so uh, animal, uh, greenhouse gases from animals account for 15% of greenhouse gases that are emitted in the world. Now that might, to some people, might seem like a small number, but that 15% is the equivalent of the emissions from every car, every bus, every airplane, every train, every ship in the world. So the animals that we raise to consume emit more greenhouse gases than all of the transportation combined. If we were to switch to whole food plant-based eating, those emissions would come down by 73%. So it is a super powerful impact. And I'm not suggesting that everybody, because my journey wasn't like I woke up and I was whole food plant based the next day. It, was, it took time and it, and it took getting informed and getting more information and then having a desire to have a different outcome. So I would suggest maybe like not having one beef burrito a week or one cheeseburger every other week. You're saving a lot of water, you're reducing emissions. And the power of just you as one person, if somebody else does that, it's super impactful. Uh, the last part I want to talk about is the moral and ethical reasons. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I want to make sure that I set a good example for my grandson and my children. I want to make sure that I leave a world that's a little better than the one I came into. And I don't, certainly don't want to make it worse. Uh, when we know better, we do better, right? Uh, and last but not least, how many of you in this room have uh, a pet? You know, a dog, a cat, a horse? So a lot of hands going up, and I'm sure that you love your pet. In fact, I'm certain of it. You wouldn't have a pet if you didn't love it, and I'm sure you'd do anything to take care of your pet. So uh, by extension, I also, um, I actually, we recently lost our cat, but we've had pets for years. And one of the things I had never considered was that the food I was eating, this animal-based diet, there is no happy ending for the animals that are raised and consumed as food. They don't have a happy life. They don't have 
a happy ending. And I personally don't want to be a part of that process anymore. That's a decision I made for myself. Now, the obvious question you might be asking yourself is, well, how come more people don't know about this information? Why is that? Why are we ill-informed? Well, <clears throat> most of the science that we're just now getting around whole food plant-based dying is a diet and, and, and the positive impacts on the body and the environment are coming from scientists who tried to study and find how animal products um, affect human health. Most of the research, however, before that was based on and funded by the Meat and Dairy Association, right? And, and those powerful interests influence government policy. And so something that to, to just think about, uh, our U.S. government, through farm sub subsidies, every year our government spends 38 billion, right, that's nine zeros, 38 billion dollars supporting Meat and Dairy Association. They spend 17 million, six zeros, supporting plants. Right? Those are big numbers, so let's bring it down to something that's more manageable. Stated differently, the federal government, through the form of subsidies, for every dollar that they spend supporting meat and dairy farmers, they spend less than half a penny supporting farmers who grow plants. Right? Now, <clears throat> in order to affect change, it has to start with one person doing one thing differently. And as more and more people have changed and started eating whole food plant-based or maybe eating less meat and substituting other things, we have new products in the marketplace, right? I can think back to 10, 15 years ago when I would go into Knob Hill or Safeway if I wanted to buy an organic tomato, if, it, if they even had it or any organic produce, it was like on a table this size. Now when you go into most supermarkets, most of the fruits and vegetables we have are organic because there was a demand for it and the producers are gonna step in because they wanna be profitable, they wanna meet the demand. The same thing goes with uh, non-meat alternatives. So now, you know, a lot of places you probably heard about the Impossible Burger, these meat substitutes that are plant-based. So I think as we as consumers start changing our lifestyles, the uh, policy and the farmers will follow suit because they wanna make money, right? So it, it, it's kind of like a, a ripple in the pond. Now, um, before I open it up for questions, there's one short little thing, because you're probably wondering, well, if I wanted to make this transition for myself, like, how do I do it? What do I eat, right? How do I have a healthy diet? So I have a short video that I want to share with you that kind of talks about that, and it's something that I do for myself. My grandfather on my mother's side was Danish. He immigrated here as a young man from Denmark. Um, he only had a sixth grade education. He wound up having eight children. Uh, he became a master baker, owned three different bakeries. Um, four of his children went on to college. And he was very proud of his Danish culture. And any opportunity he had, he would introduce us to different great Danes. Right? So one, there was a very famous Danish philosopher. His name is Soren Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard had what he called life's great paradox. Does everybody know what the word paradox means? So not to put anybody on spot. So a paradox is when you have two seemingly opposing things that occur at the same time, like opposites. And to Kierkegaard's thinking, the great paradox in life is that we live at moving forward, right? You can't go back and redo yesterday, right? And, and so the paradox for him was that we live life moving forward, but only do we learn knowledge through typically the things that didn't go right the previous day? So we live life moving forward, but it only makes sense when we look in the rearview mirror. And, and the reason I bring that up is, you know, had I known that slide I showed you, the picture of me at 25, that the food I was eating was going to have the negative impact it had on my life when I was 57, I certainly would have made different choices, right? <clears throat> so... Um, I would ask each of you sometime today or maybe before you go to bed tonight, just take 30 seconds and visualize yourself when you're my age. I'm 57 and a half. And, and what is the person you want to be at that point? Do you want to have cardiovascular disease? Do you want to be treated for cancer? Do you want to be diabetic? Do you want to be obese? Do you want to continue to accelerate climate change? Do you want to be a part of cruelty to animals? You know, so you have to visualize it for yourself because when armed with the facts, when we know better, we do better. 
Now, I don't want to appear to be a hypocrite and tell you that I'm trying to convert you all to vegans, because I'm not. I made the choice for myself based on bad choices leading up to a better choice. And so what I want to do is arm you with facts, and one way to learn is through personal stories. We all have our story, right? Um, so that maybe you might, instead of eating a cheeseburger a week, you might order an Impossible Burger. And if you were to do that, at least on the day you did that, your veins would be really happy. They'd be 40% less constricted. The inflammation going into your veins would be reduced by 70%. And you would have saved enough water that you could basically buy yourself 18 more showers in the future, right? That's what the facts tell us. So small changes over time have a huge impact. That's the last thought I wanna leave you with. And then the other thing I will tell you is in my own journey, um, Eating a whole food plant-based diet has had so many positive impacts on my life. One that I did not expect, in fact, I thought it wasn't going to be possible at all, is that I actually enjoy food much more. My um, taste buds, my palate is much more acute than when I was eating the standard American diet. Food tastes great now. I never knew oranges, apples, strawberries tasted as good as they do now because my palate was blunted from the sad diet that we typically eat. So thank you for your time and attention. I don't know much. Thank you. Yes.